So the Bible is written in such a way, it's a narrative form, and so I wish that it had thumb marks where you could go and, and run down and, and look up, you know, motherhood, right, and stick your thumb there in M and open it up and read a clear description about what God has an expectation uh, for that role inside of our lives and how do we do that best and what are best practices uh, down through the centuries inside of scripture and, and how do we best uh, execute that situation inside of our circumstances and especially for individuals, three of you who are looking forward to having a baby and maybe it's the first time you've ever been a mom and, and you're wanting to try to figure that all out and, and where do we go ahead inside of God's word to grab that information. And so not only for motherhood but also the specifics around our character and our nature and how does God want to build that into our lives and because this is written in such a way the Bible gives us the stories of people the stories of people that we can look at and say you know that attribute or that character or how God formed that inside of their life I want God to do that inside of my life and so today we want to take a look at a couple of women inside of scripture who come right off of the page as examples and then also recognize not only their names because it's important we know their names, but also the character that God is using to build into their lives that we could see reflected in our lives. Now what's unique about this is that this is not just a situation for moms, but we have the capacity to learn from the people who are listed inside of Scripture and, and how can God move inside of our hearts and lives to shape these situations, to shape this character, to shape His nature inside of our lives. And so we want to take a look at a couple of the women inside of scripture today <clears throat> and so the first mom that we're going to consider today on the pages of scripture she was sad she was frustrated and she was angry but it had nothing to do with being a mom because she wasn't yet a mom she was sad and she was frustrated and she was angry because she was not able to have children and not only that her husband also had another wife and his other wife had several children. He may have married again because she was not able to provide children, but we include her in this list of powerful moms today, of important moms whose name we want you to know because she has a tremendous story to tell. She was a mom of untiring sacrifice. And moms, that's a job that we all live into, an untiring sacrifice. Her name is Hannah. You can find her story in the Old Testament. And as I said, when we first meet her, she's not a mother. But she was determined, nonetheless, through her frustration, through her sadness, and even through her anger, to keep her eyes on the Lord and to pray and to cast her burdens on the Lord. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we pick up and we read that year after year, her husband went to town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord God Almighty. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her, kept taunting her, and this went on year after year after year. There were times that scripture says that she wept, she would not even eat. She was so despondent over this situation. One day, when they had finished eating and drinking, Hannah stood up. Eli the priest was sitting on the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, she prayed and she wept bitterly. Have you been there, moms, where you've prayed and you've wept bitterly? Your heart just completely broken? As she kept on praying, the priest observed her mouth. She was praying with all of her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. He assumed that she had been drinking. And the priest admonished her, and he said, put away your wine. How long are you going to be drunk? And she said to the priest, it's just not so. I haven't been drinking at all. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking. I was simply pouring out my heart and soul to the Lord. And she said, don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying in anguish and grief. And the priest said to her, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked. So as Hannah was praying there in 1 
Samuel chapter 1. In verse 11, she made a vow to the Lord, and she said, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and give me a son, I will give him back to the Lord all of his days, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And so as the priest blessed her and sent her home, the next morning she worshipped. She was with her husband, and God granted her request for a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked the Lord for him. Moms, I wonder how many of you have prayed and asked the Lord for a son or a daughter who prayed for that son and daughter. And so after she weaned this baby, as young as he was, she honored her promise. And she took the boy to the priest. And she said, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, do you remember me? I am the woman who stood beside you praying desperately for a child. And the Lord granted me what I asked of him. And for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And then we read in 1 Samuel, and he worshipped the Lord there. That he is this little boy. He learned how to worship from his mama. And can you imagine, moms, that moment? Just weaning your child and leaving them there at the temple. We're bringing them here to Sharptown and saying, here you go, Doug. <laughs> I'm giving him to the Lord. She made a huge sacrifice. Moms, don't we all make huge sacrifices for our children? Look, it might be our girlish figure. So there's this problem when we have a baby sometimes. Or our gray hair. <laughs> But the sacrifice of praying and giving our children to the Lord is really no sacrifice at all. Every year, Scripture says that the mom went back and she made him a little robe in just his size. She took it and she would give it to him year after year after year when she would see him. And you know what's one of my favorite moments in this passage? When she first hands him to the priest, Eli... Beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 2 is a whole song of a praise. I prayed for this child. My heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord, no one beside you, no rock like our God. Moms, I just want to encourage you from the story of Hannah today. That when you have anguish and when you have difficulty, and that will come, even if it hasn't yet, that will come in the season of adversity and of challenges or opposition. May you be encouraged by Hannah. Pour out your heart. God knows your heart. You might look crazy. Many of you have been here at the altar praying, and it looks like you're under some kind of influence. You're just in the spirit, talking to our God. And you know what's cool? The priest said to Hannah after they brought their son Samuel, may God bless you and grant you more children. Friends, can I tell you that we have untiring obedience, untiring sacrifice. God honors that. In addition to that, prayer is a powerful tool that God will use us to have us stay connected to him, strengthen our spiritual maturity, and use as a weapon to overcome the tactics of the enemy. The other woman who taunted her, who made fun of her, who said horrible things to her, Hannah pours out her heart. She offers her child to the Lord. What more could we want than offer our children to the Lord that they would grow up like Samuel in God's presence? Friends, I want you to remember Hannah's name this morning. In addition to Hannah, the story of perseverance, of faith in the midst of circumstance, continuing to persevere in the midst of her situation and then offering God's blessing back to him. I want to turn your attention to a person who's unmentioned initially 
inside of the book of Exodus. It's a remarkable story that tells us about a woman who decides she's going to attempt to save her son's life. The Pharaoh had offered and had made a statement that all little boy babies would be eliminated. And she takes her son, newly born, and makes a basket and covers it with pitch and with tar and floats it in the Nile. It's an incredible story of timing and God's providence as Pharaoh's daughter is there on the banks of the Nile and notices the basket. The little baby inside of the basket needs a mom. And so this woman's oldest daughter goes to Pharaoh's daughter and says, Listen, I know somebody who can take care of that little baby. And so Pharaoh's daughter moves Moses into the most opulent, the most powerful, the most educated place on earth. And there he's raised in the midst, in the midst of a group of individuals who are polytheistic, who have no intention whatsoever of serving God, who have no intention whatsoever of living for God, who have no intention whatsoever of following God. There inside of Pharaoh's household, we find Moses is raised miraculously by his own mother and his bonus mom, Pharaoh's daughter. It's not until you get to the sixth chapter of the book of Exodus, four chapters later, that you even learn her name. And she's got an unusual name, Moses' mom. Her name is Jochebed, or some would say it is Jochebed, depending upon whether the O is long or not. Let's go to the next slide if we could. As we see there, notice that her name means glorious, honorable, God's glory. How is it that a woman has the capacity when everything and every tide of culture is moving against her, she raises a young man who is monotheistic, only one God, who serves Yahweh, God Almighty, and follows Him. When everyone around does not. It's a remarkable story of influence. It's a remarkable story of Jacobed's influence on Moses. And listen, you know what that's like. All of culture is moving in a direction that is not towards God, but away from God. People in your own family at that point are moving away from God and not towards God. Circumstance dictates and shows you that all of the influences are away from God and not toward God. Have hope today, moms. Here is a story of amazing influence that against all circumstance and all imaginable opposition, Moses, monotheist, only one God, knows Yahweh, can call him by name, is reminded that he should be one who follows him with his whole life. Your influence today is not discounted by culture. Your influence today is not discounted by public opinion. Your influence today is not even discounted by your own family members. Continue to influence the people around you to be people who follow our God 
who give their hearts to Jesus Christ. And make no mistake about it, age doesn't disqualify you from this mandate. Her name is Jochebed. God's glory. Honorable. She's glorious. She's the mother of Moses. So we have two more moms today to consider by name, in addition to all of you moms that we honor and celebrate here today, but two more, and it's a tag team of a mom and a grandmom. Their names are Eunice and Lois. They loved the Lord, and their example propelled the son and the grandson to follow the Lord. We hear about the story of this young man named Timothy as Paul writes about his young protege. And he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives also in you. There's a couple words that I want to pick out from that passage of Scripture, and the first one would be this sincere faith. Do you know that the word sincere in the Greek actually means genuine, not fake, undisguised, unhidden, on full display? Friends, that says to me that this mom and this grandma, they were real. They were genuine, and they lived out of faith that this Timothy saw in them. And then we see the word lived, that first lived in these women. Do you know that the word lived actually means in the original language, dwelt? This sincere faith dwells in these women. Do you know that a dwelling place often refers to a house or where people live? The home that we currently live in at our house, we purchased 10 years ago, and we have dwelt in this house that we consider a complete and total blessing from God for almost a decade. It's filled with memories. It's where we have raised our family, where we've eaten hundreds and hundreds of meals, some with many of you. We've had game nights with family and friends. We've hosted many small groups. Some of you have been there. We've had youth group parties and swim, swim parties and bonfire events. And I invite all of you to come do those things at our house this summer. We've had a wedding rehearsal dinner. Joey and Becca had their wedding rehearsal. We're soon to have an engagement party. Noah and Kayla just got engaged a week ago. If you don't know that, congratulations. You guys can just wave. Yeah. We've lit all fireworks in our backyard. There's been a lot of living that has taken place in our home, and that's been the case for yours as well. It's our dwelling place. What Paul is saying here is that in the hearts of this mom and grandmom, Lois and Eunice, faith was the dwelling place. Faith lived in their dwelling place. God has been there. God has lived life with them. It's an active faith. It's an alive faith. The Bible defines faith as living. It's one of those things that takes place each and every day as we seek to follow God and to love him. We go where God leads. That's an alive faith, a faith that dwells a faith where memories are made with our God. So let's consider Eunice and Lois, the mom and grandmom. It tells us that mom was a Jewish Christian whose father, Timothy's father, was not a Christian. It says, whose mother was a Jewish believer, Timothy, whose father was Greek. Moms, I think that there's something here that encourages you today. Timothy's mom didn't have an ideal husband and father for her son. We have moms here who are raising your kids on your own, or some of you moms, your husband isn't where you'd like them to be spiritually. But look, that didn't disqualify Timothy. His mom and his grandmom instilled faith in him despite less than ideal circumstances. And moms, that's enough. When our eyes are on Jesus and we have a sincere, authentic faith that lives inside of us, God uses that for his glory and his honor. Paul later writes, 
in 2 Timothy, but as for you, talking about his protege Timothy, and what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. They taught him the holy scriptures from his infancy. The Old Testament scriptures that they came to know, the New Testament probably wasn't even around yet at this time, but they shared what they knew. They contributed to his faith so that he became an effective leader in the early church. So a couple thoughts, moms. You know as well as I do that we can have a genuine, authentic faith. Teach our children the Bible, but yet our kids make their own decisions. It doesn't always go this way. But I want to encourage you, don't give up, because at any given time, the Holy Spirit, in response to your prayers and your faith, will prompt your children to respond. Remember Hannah crying out to the Lord, and God answered her prayer. Lois and Eunice, this tag team, mom and grandma, were faithful in teaching and training their grandson in the truth of scriptures. This week, moms, let me encourage you to ask this question. How do you want to use me to advance your kingdom? We're not all called to be missionaries in foreign countries to advance God's kingdom, but if you're a mom, there's a mission field in your home. If you're a grandmom, there's a mission field in your grandchild's life. There's a mission field in your neighborhood. And so as one last reminder, some of you are not moms. But God's given you every opportunity to be a spiritual mom to perhaps a son or a daughter who needs a stand-in mom. And that happens all across this campus here at Sharptown Church, where many of you stand in for the younger generation and mentor them so that they know Jesus Christ better. Moms, you're wearing a name tag. You have a name. We can see your name. Everybody has a name tag this morning. I would encourage you, in addition to your own children and grandchildren, begin to pray about whose name God might lay on your heart that you might be a spiritual role model. Everybody in this room, everyone with a name, and that's every one of you, can be a part of sharing the name of Jesus with others, just like Eunice and Lois, even in a culture in their own home where dad was perhaps not on board. Their faith was sincere. Their faith was genuine. Not perfect, I'm sure, but sincere. And God dwelt in their heart. And it was obvious, may that be for you moms as well. I'm going to ask if the music team will make their way back to the platform. And then too, let me just say to you, that names become critically important. Not only people's names who have become a pattern inside of scripture, but also they remind us of our character. Our character. You recall, if you will, not only we have Hannah and Jacobed and Eunice and Lois, but then your name gets added to the roster of people of influence, people of faith, people who love unconditionally. And so listen, uh, moms, we're going to ask if you're going to take, this is going to be rather quick. Uh, we're going to uh, invite you. There are tiles, Scrabble tiles, all around the auditorium. Uh, moms, this morning, if you would like to go ahead, I uh, want to invite you to run to one of those tables. I'd like to invite you to find the tiles that would spell out your name this morning. Find the tiles that would spell out your name this morning, and then return to your seats. The music's going to go ahead and play background, and then we're going to step into a closing course this morning. And so you have uh, three minutes and counting this morning, I think, at that point. Uh, so here we go. Uh, ready? Go. Let's spell out your name so with moms, the tiles that are on one the One word of direction if you're paying attention. There are holders for the letters of your name. If your name is five letters or less, you want to grab a small tile holder. Leave the big ones for big names. So five words or less. If you want to holder to put your name on. You certainly can do that. We have a few more. Gracie's in the back if we run out of those letters. Put them on your little chart and take them back to your seat. Small ones for five letters or less.
take them. You're going to find your letters. Yeah, take them with you. That was the question. Take them with you. If you run out of letters at your spot, try another one. Get a tile holder. Great question, Katie. We've got to have the smartest congregation on earth. up that course again. He knows my name. Every one of us this morning, whether we're celebrating Mother's Day today, we're being recognized, we're being honored, or whether you're here in support of those around you, we recognize today that God is a God who knows your name and the circumstances inside of your life. Let's pick this course up one more time. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when, when I call. And hears me. And hears me when. Hannah, Jochebed, Eunice, and Lois. There are names that you should know today. Names and people that we should notice their character and notice how God has moved inside of their life. If you're here this morning, though, and you think that everything that's been said or everything that's been talked about today doesn't apply to you, I have a good word for you this morning. Out of Isaiah 43, share these words with me as we close our time together. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And here it is. Listen. To the Lord who created you, the one who formed you says, Sharp town, do not be afraid. I've ransomed you. Today, I have called you by 
name. Moms, today, listen to me. If you think you're by yourself, if you think that no one knows, if you think you're in a circumstance today that seems just completely unmanageable, He walks with you today. You are not by yourself. You are mine, says the Lord. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned and the flames will not consume you. He knows your name. Will you bow with me? And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, to whom honor, power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Hey, fellas, don't forget to sign up on the clipboard. <laughs>